We want to welcome all our participants from Ghana and around the world for joining us. Thank you. This is our maiden edition, and we are looking forward to making it exciting. Um, to start with, like something has said, we have some of our panelists who would be here present with us. We have Mr. Mark Aite from Ghana Water Company, and then we have Mr. Latte from CWSA. So I will start off with um, C uh, Ghana Standards Authority. Um, Mr. Latin, just to, if you can give us a brief overview, you've been analyzing the water quality from various sources and various industries. What is the state of our water quality these days? I must say that um, for the samples that we analyze, most of them are concentrated on drinking water. We have this uh, department. We have this department in the institution, product certification department, which is supposed to certify all drinking water that are, supposed, that are produced here in Ghana. So for most of them, because they go through the normal treatment methods, the quality standards are very high. They usually pass before they get certified and then they go to FDA for their registration and approval. So in terms of the drinking water quality, then I uh, say the specifications are so high, so the qualities are good before they are released. All right, thank, thank you very much for that. Maybe I should move closer to you. Yes, so Mr. Mr. Ite, from, coming from Ghana Water, Ghana water I mean, we, we've, we've heard in recent weeks the challenges with the water quality and all that. For your introductory remarks, what would you say is the current state of water quality in Ghana, raw water quality? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, as we are all aware, currently we have a lot of challenges with our various water bodies with respect to the water quality. So currently, I, what I can say is the state of our source waters are very poor. Apart from the Galamsey activities that are impacting negatively on the water resources, which is posing a lot of problems or challenges for drinking water supply, it also poses challenges to other uses like farming, fisheries, and even the ecosystem functions. And apart from this galamse, another big and serious challenge is uh, the general environmental issues concerning poor waste management, industrial waste management, uh, uh, municipal waste management, agricultural practices, and even aquaculture are impacting negatively on the source waters. So, you know, what, who, looking at what we have been analyzing on daily basis, what you can say is the state of our, most of our water sources now, the water quality states are poor. <laughs> All right, th thank you for uh, this assessment of our water quality. In Ghana Water, over the years, I know that you've been keeping track of uh, the raw water quality data. And I don't want us to talk about Galamse. I don't want us to headline this with Galamse, but I want us to talk about the other contaminants of our raw water source that it looks like we are not paying attention to. If you can throw more light on it for us. Okay, like you rightly said, uh, we are paying a lot of attention to Galamse because the Galamse activities impact on the water. We can see the color change and all those things. But if when it comes to even the water treatment, it is easier to even deal with these Galamse issues when it comes to high turbidity colors. But one major, other major areas we are not paying attention to are these emerging pollutants 
and then these uh, micropollutants, uh, pharmaceuticals, and all those things that run into the water. And those uh, substances in their minute quantities can pose a lot of dangers to consumers. And as a nation, one of the major challenges for industrial and municipal waste management, which impacts so much on the water sources. So, and these are even d difficult to be dealt with. As uh, then, um, it meaning you have to put in a very robust and treatment system to take care of these. And they also pose a lot of health challenges to the consumers. So it is an area that we really have to pay much, much attention to. We are thinking, oh, because Galamsi, we can, for the Galamsi, we can readily you know, see the impact. But the more dangerous ones, we cannot see them with a naked eye. They are complex. They are very complex and even difficult to be to deal with. So we need to look at uh, integrated water resources management holistically and pay much attention to the other drivers and pressures that impact negatively on our water resources like sustainable we have to consider sustainable sustainable agriculture practices which really lead to a lot of nutrient loads into the water the municipal waste management industrial waste management are these key areas we have to pay attention to in terms of regulations and uh, other uh, best practices. So, thank you. So, Mr. Lacky, just to come to you, um, uh, Mark mentioned uh, difficult to treat contaminants that are uh, emerging in our raw water bodies. From GSA's perspective, what have you seen so far in your, your analysis? Um, Usually for us, the, as I said earlier, the samples we receive mainly are drinking water samples. It's just once in a while that we receive this raw, raw water from other sources. In fact, if smart can attest, we, they, from time to time, send us samples from Takrade, the original office from Takrade, Kumasi, and then uh, the northern region. But from the analysis we have carried out for those waters over the period, we realized the quality is not as bad as we are made to think. For most of them, they come to conduct the heavy metal pollutants in them. And then for the heavy metals, when we re look at it against our specification, they are usually within the specification. We also do we also do pesticide scans on the raw water samples and they are almost always not detected. So then probably I would say for us, per what we are seeing, per the data we have, the quality is not as bad as we are made to look. All right, so uh, basically, Mr. Lattis, you are trying to tell us that Ghana Water is doing a good job with its treatment. And, okay, so it should give us confidence that Ghana Water, irrespective of the numerous challenges they are facing, they are able to handle the process and the treatment process, which is very good. Um, I don't know if we have um, Dr. Kakare on the line. Oh, you have a rebuttal. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, it is true that uh, some of these uh, uh, parameters are within the acceptable range, but uh, some of these heavy metals and other parameters, the fact that they are within the range, the mo the fact that they are detected, meaning they pose what a lot of what risk. They might be below the thresholds, but the fact that they are detected is what a major concern. So. Even in the drinking water, if it is within the range, the continual consumption poses what a, a higher risk to the consumer, which can lead to bioaccumulations within your system. So, the fact that they are detected should be a major concern to us. Mm -hmm. 
So now I, I want us to think about the sources of these recalcitrant and hard to treat contaminants. You are saying that the fact that they've shown up in our raw water source, it means that we should be concerned about it, right? Where do you think that these sources of contaminants are coming from? I mean, obviously, I don't want us to focus on galamsey because we know galamsey and its effects, but these hard to treat, maybe some examples and where they are coming from. Yes. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier, that in, apart from Galamse, we all know that as a country, uh, our waste management uh, aspect is very, very poor. So the runoff from any super waste, poor industrial waste management, all these things run into the to our water bodies. <laughs> And one of the major challenges is also agriculture because the nutrient loads in our water resources are very high. And these nutrients can lead to the algae proliferations. And we know these can also lead to these cyanotoxins. They die off, then they release the cyanotoxins, which are very uh, dangerous to human health. So agriculture many super waste management, industrial waste management, aquaculture and these and apart from industrial these uh, hospital waste management and all those things are key sources that lead to the oh, these raw water sources for contaminations and or oh, wherever we dump our this indiscriminate waste disposal with all kinds of substances, they all run at the end of the when it rains, they run up, they all end up in our water bodies. And not only the, the surface water, but they also percolate to the groundwater. And you know, a lot of people exploit the ground, groundwater for other uh, uses. So, apart from Galamsey, these are the key areas that impose a lot of threats to our water sources. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Lati, I know that GSA will set standards for everything we do in Ghana. In, in the water space, I know you, apart from the drinking water quality, we also have standards for treated industrial effluent. <laughs> what will you say is the level of compliance you that you've seen? I'm sure you do routine testing and all that. Do you see compliance? Are people defaulting? What, what's the trend generally? I must say that when it comes to compliance, it is really on the low side. As I speak with you now, we have just about a few industries that come with the effluence, that come to test their effluence. In fact, even this has improved because just in recent times, we had a collaboration with the Environmental Protection Agency, who are actually on the back of some of these um, industries to ensure that they actually comply with the wastewater treatment before it is discharged into our water bodies. But the few that are coming, although the metals, some of the pollutants are in there, so far, they meet the specification. We have some from the those who operate the tank farms. They come virtually every month. They, they submit samples for analysis. There are also, also others from the beverage industry. I wouldn't want to mention names, but they, but they are very, 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 very few. So then we talk about, we want to encourage most of them to come. Because when it comes to the beverage industry and the food industry like this, they hardly come for some of these analysis. But then those in the oil industry, a few of them in the oil industry, usually come regularly for analysis. And for them, I can say that the specifications are within the normal range that we expect. All right. Thank you very much. I, I mean, it's gratifying to know that in spite of the rather few number that uh, bring their uh, samples for analysis, at least they are getting some level of compliance. I, I'm 
I, w- I want us to talk a little bit about um, the from from Ghana Water the the capacity of your treatment systems now. I mean, because I know that when they are building a water treatment plant, they they use a base scenario to design a base scenario as in base raw water quality to design the treatment plant with all these things that we are seeing in the in the raw water source. How 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 are your treatment plants coping? And are, are, are they ready for the future? Okay, thank you very much. Right, like you said, right, uh, we when we are designing the treatment systems, we have the baselines for the various uh, parameters. So in most cases, we look at the historical data then the present data, then we trying to use the worst case scenario. So about 20 years, 10 years ago, what was the quality? What is the quality today? Then when you do that one to project that, okay, in 20 years, the possibility that the water quality will deteriorate so bad. So we trying to use the worst case scenario to as a baseline for the design of the treatment systems and again we are required to uh, now we have to design the as whatever we're doing the approach is to use a risk-based management approach indeed which is uh, which is required of us to use a water safety plans approach to manage the systems and this requires us to put in multiple barriers along the entire water treatment chain so as we are aware that now environmental issues are a major challenges so we trying to put in those what multiple barriers so some of the multiple barriers we put in today we might not use them today but tomorrow if the challenge comes out, then we activate those what systems. So the factors we're considering that is to make sure we design the system to cater for the worst case scenario and put in multiple barriers to address any challenge but that might come up in the future. Mm-hmm. So, um, talking of multiple barriers, um, apart from the classical uh, water treatment systems that are typical for most of your plants, are you able to share with us what um, innovations Ghana Water Company has been involved in in the last year or in the last couple of years that is preparing for the future, that is making sure that... um, these things that you are talking about are safely in place. Okay, yeah. So I was talking about the 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 the, the rigs bees approach, which employs us to use the water safety plants. And these water safety plants, like I said, we are, we are expected to put in multiple barriers. But what in the past? The normal water quality management system, which uh, just expect us to what, do water testing to find out whether the water is okay. But you know, the process is a continuous uh, process. So by the time the water quality test is, results are ready, the people have already consumed the water and whatever um, challenges they may suffer, they have suffered those words. So to minimize that, we are expected to use the water safety plans, which prevents contaminations along the supply, right from the catchment to the consumer uh, interface. So you need not wait for the problem to occur before you address it. So now, initially, the GSC standard, the Ghana drinking water standards are not really based on even this risk base. So now, they have also included that in their standards, which we are also expected to what, adapt and what. So, the, the Ghana uh, 
the, uh, the Ministry of Water Resources and Sanitation in 2015 also came out with the Ghana National Drinking Water Quality Management Framework, mm -hmm, which employs us to use this word. And the water suppliers, like the urban, peri urban, the rural, private, and the vendors are expected to use for this approach. So, as a company, we and we also supposed to come to that drinking water qual um, quality policy, which we have developed now. We have also developed the policy for the uh, and the water safety plans. So now we are now ruling it out gradually uh, throughout our supply systems, which seeks to put in these multiple barriers, uh, which adapt the rigs based and management approach to prevent the 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 various possibilities of contaminations so you need not wait for the problem to occur before you wait. but the tra so the traditional way is to what wait take the sample do the analysis by then the water is consumed but this is to what be proactive so then this is more proactive approach than the previous passive approach where the problem occurs before you trying to find so here you uh, trying to come out with these uh, policies, the regulations, then you analyze your water supply systems, then you validate and verify, then you take the necessary corrective actions ahead of time because you know the problems are there, they cannot care. So you have to minimize the possibility of them entering the, the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the very extensive uh, explanation on the water quality safety plan. I mean, from what you're saying, it just tells me that I think that um, from what you're saying, the water safety plan should go beyond just drinking water operators and the allied industries because if the source water is coming, it's going to be polluted by industries, agriculture, hospitals, and all that, then it, it's important that the water safety plan takes into account all these other industries to make sure that they are not negatively impacting our water bodies before you even start your treatment, right? Yeah, I think you are right. So like I said, the water safety plans look at the project right from the catchment. So when you are trying to implement these uh, water safety plans, you have to bring in all the, all the stakeholders and right away from the catchment, the municipal assemblies, the various regulatory agencies, the primary stakeholders, the farmers within the catchment, so all the opinion leaders, the chiefs. So what can we do to minimize the even contaminations of the source water before. So if we are able to minimize that, the concentrations of all these parameters are, are will be at the, uh, the barest minimum. And that will also not put pressure, too much pressure on the treatment system. The, you can easily what take care of what whatever the, the lower levels and again it even minimizes our cost of what treatment so like you said right away we trying to what minimize that right from the catchment that is why every all the, the key stakeholders must be brought on board when they be so you first of all identify your key stakeholders when you are putting up the team because if you don't bring them on board you cannot really achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So there, there's one more thing that um, comes to mind when we are talking about this water policy. And that has got to do with, I, I don't know if GSA has validated, I, I know as Okay, so I'm sure, um, maybe not GSA, but maybe CSIR. CSIR also gets a lot of visibility. 
CSIR gets a lot of visibility on uh, the operations of of uh, industries and the like. And CWSA, also like Ghana Water Company, they also deal in the abstraction and treatment of surface and groundwater bodies. And we are we are happy to have uh, yes, we are happy to have yeah the Lali here to help us with the challenges that CWSA is facing in their work. We've been discussing from Ghana Water how the impact of of uh, I wouldn't say Galamse, but other contaminants are impacting on their work. And we want to know from CWSA what's the status of your water source and its impact on your treatment systems. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, uh, CWAC currently is also using the water safety plan approach yeah, in sorting out its water quality challenges. But then I'll say that um, the challenges that we have observed so far is to do with the sun winning operations on the Volta River. Currently, we abstract water from Volta River. And then also, we also do boreholes. Some of our systems are surface water schemes, and then some are also borehole based. So with the surface water, we realize that the activities of the sun winning, which are very close to our abstraction points, and happens to be upstream, which is having an adverse uh, effect on the quality of water abstracted. And then also this is posing a challenge to the filter medias that we are having at the treatment plants. Because of that, um, uh, we the agency has to spend a lot of money in treating this water that is replacing the filter medias and all that, the pumps and all that. And then also with the groundwater situation, currently what the situation that we are facing with is um, low pH. That's water abstracted, most of them, most of the borehole eaters, they have low pH and then um, total ion content, which is uh, a serious challenge the agency currently is dealing with. Yeah, so basically those are the challenges that we are having now in terms of the abstracted water, yes. You mentioned sun winning. Is, is on the Volta River. Is that the only main problem that CWSA is facing? Yes. Just sand winning. Looking at where we are positioned. Okay. The geographical locations where we are positioned. Yes, is the sand winning. That is what we have identified so far. Currently, we are trying to do further studies, research about the quality of water we are getting. But currently, what we've observed is the, the sanguineness and then fish farming, okay. which mostly are located upstream. When you take our system at um, Osudoku, for instance, we have a sanguineness activity which is going on there, which is having adverse effects in terms of impacting, like um, affecting the stability of what I've started. And then also with the fish farms, we realize that um, the nutrient levels are very high in purification. That is challenges that we are having because as this goes on, it it clogs the filter media, which requires that we have to be cleaning these filters very often than the normal schedule. Yeah. All right, Plassi, I believe your team is set. Okay, all right. In the meantime, if you have any questions, kindly put them in the chat session. Um, we'll read them and get the desired responses for you. I want to start with um, Mr. Delalia from CWSA. Before we went on the break, we were talking about Ghana Water. I just made mention of the water safety plan, which they are using. And you also uh, made allusion to the fact that CWSA is also making use of the water safety plan. You also mentioned about the activities of sand winning on your operations. Later, you added the operations of fish farming to your operation. If you care to elaborate more on how fish farming on the river bodies are impacting on your operations. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, like I told you earlier on that these fish farms are located upstream. And then we all realize that managing a fish farm involves a lot. One is a feed that they use to feed the fishes online. And then what we've also realized is they are railing this fish on the river. Unlike other places that a pond is created, the fish are being well there. But this time around, the rearing of the fish is going on on the river. So you realize that these fish feeds that are being used contain a lot of nutrients. So these nutrients end up getting into the water body. And then also we've also realized that some of these fishes also die along the way. And then as they rot away and all that, it tends up to increase the nutrient levels. And then this goes straight into our intake points. And then what happens is that we are currently, uh, we are using the conventional treatment method, which involves the slow sun and all that. And then we all know that in this treatment, we need a, lot, a little of sunshine to remove the argies and all that. But then when you have this nutrient level very high, you realize that the growth of agi is so fast that at a slight time, you have to go and clean the, the filter media, which is a main challenge that we are having. Because currently, if you visit our site, if we clean this week, within two days, you realize that all the, the, the filter beds are clogged again, they all turn greenish. And realize that this is also um, a potential source for, for this um, disaster, which, which is not helping us at all. It is making us spend a lot of money treating that. And then also, like I mentioned, we have the surface water, we also have the boreholes. And then uh, let me talk about the, the sun waning. You know, the, the continuous agitation of the river bed releases all the elements, the chemicals in the soil into the water. For instance, when we came, we took a baseline data and realized that even fluoride was below the threshold. But after some time, we realized that fluoride was going up. You understand? And then we trace it to this, that the, uh, the sun burning activity is going on upstream, which we've even reported to EPA to assess us, relocate this um, activities downstream. Because from there, it goes into our um, intake points. And then our filters, you know fluoride is a, a problematic element. It needs special filters to filter all this and out, which the slow sand is not too capable of doing that. So that has been a serious challenge. And then across the country to we, we, uh, where our systems are located are along the mining um, areas. We have problems of um, cyanide, arsenic, and all that's also over there. So currently, the agency is employing technology to treat water. Based on the demand for water, you realize that the slow sun filters are not helping us meet expectations. Yes, because the slow sun one, it occupies space. If you want to treat a huge volume, meaning you need to create huge chambers and all that with sand and all that. So now currently the agency is moving from the slow sun to rapid filtration. So we are using the package treatment plants now, which is automated. I told you that um, from time to time, the slow sun gets clogged. And then we have to scoop all the sun, clean, wash, put them back. But with a package plant, at the press of a button, a backwash is done, which is more faster and also very rapid. And then also getting enough water to serve the communities is guaranteed. Yes, so currently that is what is going on. So with, with the package um, treatment system, you're able to deal with your cyanide, your arsenic, and then the fluoride? Yes, we have um, special medias that we, we use to fill the, the treatment plant, the package plant. 
you know, before that, uh, you know, even with the removal of iron, you know, the, the popular method is you do aeration and all that, yes. But you know, with the package plants, we have special medias that takes care of all this, yeah. So like I said, it's something the agency is now rolling on board and then uh, the research is still ongoing to improve so that at the end of the day, the best and uh, water of good quality will be served to the community. Yeah. I'm interested in the packet treatment plants that you mentioned. Would you say that the packet treatment is the next step to improving access to drinking water to rural communities? Yes, I'll say that it's, it's the next available best option. Like I mentioned earlier on, uh, with the slow sun filters, that one, it occupies space. It's a bit bulky and then also um, need a technical support in its operations all the time. Like you need the people with the required skills because if you can't just ask anybody to just go and clean your filters for you because you have to take off the sun, clean, treat, backwash, and then you, you replace. But with a package plant, everything is automated. Like I said, a layman can be trained. It's just a push of a button. And even some of these systems are automated that when there's this pressure difference, okay. the system itself automatically okay. backwash. Yeah, so you just need somebody there to do the supervision. Okay. Yes, and then also with the water delivery, it's on the higher side because with a, like the name suggests rapid filtration. So it's able to filter this water quick enough, making sure all impurities are taken out so that we can have enough water for the community. Yeah. All right, so um, Mr. Mr. Aite, if uh, I'm happy you mentioned package systems. What, what is the innovation Ghana Water is introducing? Okay. Well, I think when, whether it is conventional or package system is about how the system is robust enough to take care of these. Uh, uh, okay, before I come to whether what we are doing, I just want to uh, say something to what uh, our colleague from CWSC put across. So you talk about the algae proliferations that are affecting your feta media. And I believe CWSA, your feta media beds are open to the sun. So for us as a company, what, you know, the agi will come, they will be, the, when they said sunshine is to molest the agi proliferation. So what we do is to house all the feta media, you know, for photosynthesis to take place. If you're able to eliminate one of the conditions, then cannot what take place. If you're able to take away water, oxygen, or the sunlight. So if you're, and apart from the, that, when you house the feta beds, the dust and other particles that come from outside are prevented from what entering. So that um, increases the performance of your feta beds and also prevents. So even as part of the water safety plans, putting in multiple barriers is one of the surest way of what improving on the water quality on the water quality. So CWSA could consider uh, housing their feta beds and then you can still use the rapid filtration uh, method for the conventional system. So we are, for all our systems, we are using the rapid filtration method. We don't use the slow sand. So it is not whether it is packaged plant or conventional, it is about the facilities that you put in place that are incorporated in this particular, in the design that can take care of what these um, uh, 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 contaminants. So you were asking, what do we, uh, what we are doing? Like I said, the, for our innovations, yeah, so what the key steps we have taken, one, is to really look at our designs 
the new systems that we are designing, we are making sure that we adapt the water safety plans from the project level so that we put in these multiple barriers. We have multiple critical control points, and then we are using a stricter uh, standards or internal standards. So we, as a company, we don't, at our operational level, we don't really rely on WHO or the Ghana standards for drinking water. We have our internal standards, which are stricter than these uh, national, international standards. So that by the end of the day, before it gets to the consumer interface, it will fall within what? The range. And like I'm saying, the one of the approaches is the adoption of the uh, water safety plans. Then in the designs of these systems, we are also looking at other technologies that are more efficient, like introduction of new water treatment chemicals that are efficient in the removal of the uh, contaminants. So using the traditional aluminum sulfate now, in most of our problematic systems, we are using poly electrolyte coagulants, which are more efficient in the uh, uh, contaminant removal. We have more critical control points, and the frequency of uh, monitoring is also high. We, like I say, we have stricter internal standards, which we uh, monitor holistically so that we don't breach most of these what uh, procedures. So these are the key uh, uh, improvements we are adding on to what is already in existence. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Aitis. So um, if Dr. Kakari can hear me. Um, yes, Th thank you, sir, for joining us. Um, earlier, we wanted to know the state of our water in Ghana, the state of our water bodies in Ghana. I mean, we've heard a lot about the menace Ghana Galamse is causing. All we can see is the turbidity, the brown color. Beyond the brown color, what should we be concerned about when it comes to our water bodies? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, you, you have really said it right. Almost all our water bodies, we have about three river systems. We have the Volta, we have the Southwestern, and we have the coastal river systems. And as we talk now, almost all our water systems have been affected one way or the other, polluted, especially with regard to the illegal mining that is going on. And in the mining, they, they use cyanide, they use mercury, they use arsenic, they use oil, you know, to do their work and so on. So beside the turbidity that you see, suspended solid is also there, which is close to the turbidity. And then these um, metals and oils, and they also do other things that nutrients you know, getting into the water and so on they eat, they do their things. So there are a lot of things that are actually contained in the water apart from the stability and the suspended solid that you can see. And, and, and uh, I believe that most of these waters uh, don't have life in them. Waters that used to uh, contain a lot of fish uh, by now, when you get there, you won't get any fish. The living organisms are almost dead. So it's a very, very precarious situation that um, we are confronted with. And we need to really, really work at it. Else, there will be scarcity of water very, very soon. All right. Thank you very much, Doc, for for your input. Um, I, I think there are some few questions from some of our attendants. So, so we have a first question. And this one is coming from Bright Amoya. And Bright um, is directing this question to uh, Mr. Lati from Ghana Standards Authority. He says, 
Um, he wants to know some of the measures that have been put in place by GSA to make sure that the water we consume reach global standards so, so that it doesn't impose any implications on our health. And he's saying this because he says he's taking um, some tests on pH and he's found out that a lot of the times, most of them had um, pH as far as uh, below uh, 6.5. And so he wants to know um, what the GSA is doing I mean, to ensure water safety. I mean. So first of all, I don't know if the questioner was earlier here on the platform. I said that we have a department, product certification department, that goes around and then sample drinking water samples from these manufacturers. And then most of these things, before they go and do the sampling, they look at, they inspect the premises, make sure it is clean, and then they pick the samples for the laboratory analysis. What we realize is that when it comes to the lab, between the production house and then the lab, they are not kept under proper conditions. But what, whenever we test, we get the right results for them. It is only a few, that in the instance for the pH, it's only a few that fails. But even then when they fail, we have to make sure they go do the correction, come back, we retest, they pass before we issue them with a certificate to go ahead and then package and then sell. So it's not as if we are just there and then passing all those water. And I also have to stress that for when it comes to compliance, majority of these sachet water producers do not actually come to GSA. When you look at the package, you will see GSA standard logo on the package, but it's all taken just like that. They don't come for any testing. If you go to our website, we have put down a list of those who have actually been certified by GSA. So our advice consumers that before they go out and use any or buy any water, they will have to go to the website and then check, make sure this particular brand or product is registered with the GSA and the FDA before they go out and patronize. Because you know the system in Ghana is such that the address system is not good. So it's not even easy locating all the manufacturers. And most of them are even doing this in their homes. Just a small area, they do it, and then before you realize it's on the market selling. And you know, resources are also not enough. So we don't have enough men to always go there and then check what is happening. So he may be right. He may be right in the sense of what he's saying. But then the bigger issue is that the tests are conducted, and then we, um, we certify ourselves that it has passed before they are actually giving the go-ahead to sell. Thank you. OK, so to say something about the question the gentleman asked there, I think uh, when it comes to this standard, you see, one of the issues here is GSA, I think they are responsible for setting the standards, but they are not responsible for monitoring for compliance. Mm -hmm. So I think the enforcement for compliance is where the gap is here. When it comes to the package water, I think FDA is responsible for for these uh, enforcement and the compliance. So when it comes to the enforcement to compliance, GSA is not all that in to that, but they come out with the standards. But what we have to do as a country is to uh, look at that aspect again, uh, the enforcement for compliance is, because there are a whole lot of products out there which are not really uh, on the books of these, uh, either the certification authorities or the the the, uh, the FDA's uh, books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. So like I said, um, when we identified those um, challenges, we've um, notified EPA. And then EPA with his team came on the field to do an assessment. And then currently we are waiting for their assessment report. 
yes, that is that is an action taken so far. <laughs> and then also we are also engaging the farmers upstream, as in advising them of the chemicals they use um, in these fish farms. And then also we are also in, in touch with the district assembly to help us relocate these fish farms upstream, downstream. So that is the actions we've taken so far, please. Thank you very much for for your submissions. So I, I want to get back to Dr. Kakai. I'm it, I'm sure uh, what I CSI or what I research is you has got a trove of data on industrial wastewater quality over the years. What what do you think can be done to help the industry? Because the truth of the matter is that a lot of the industries are unable to install appropriate systems to help them treat. And looking at what our, our friends from CWS and Ghana Water are saying, I mean, the the impact is that all the chemical is flowing into their raw water source and it's making treatment difficult. What is what is CW uh, what is CSI Water Research Institute doing? to help um, industries with appropriate technologies and or what can C CSI Water Research and other external partners do to help bring solutions to the many industries in Ghana that are looking forward to appropriate systems to help them manage their wastewater. Okay, thank you very much. Um, like we rightly said, we do have some data, but it's only those who come to us, for us to work for them that uh, have data. Not all the industries have data on their water, wastewater generation. And with that data, there is nothing that you can do. But with the data, then you will know the appropriate technology that you can use to actually um, treat your waste. And we have helped uh, some industries like um, hospitality industries that have uh, uh, wastewater treatment facilities because we provide the data and you know exactly what is the characteristics of the wastewater and therefore you will know which type of treatment facility you would have to go for. Um, we don't want to mention some names, but uh, most of the industries who have their facilities in place to treat their wastewater we did work with them sometime 24 hours sampling to know the peak because if you just go for a grab sample like monthly sample it won't help you because the waste is generated continuously and so you do monitoring and be able to know which are your peak hours which one and then together you do composite to be able to know exactly what should be done so definitely all, any industry that has really come because EPA is on them, we have data for them and they themselves also have the data. So when they want to treat their waste, that'll be easy. But the problem that it looks like when you talk about uh, treatment facilities, some of them shy away because they think it's uh, expensive. So it is uh, good that um, we are discussing this today. It looks like EPA should make sure that these industries, um, because some of them have data, uh, still down with us, know the data and know no appropriate uh, treatment that we can give to them. Some of them maybe primary treatment facility can do away with a lot. Some may be simple dilution also, and then maybe your pH is fine or whatever. So um, it is good that um, um, we all concertedly come together and then do that. But these things, if they are not under any compliance or under any obligation to do it, they will not, because it's easier to just push your waste into the environment. So I think that we don't have the mandate. Our work right, is so thank you very, Thank you very much for your input. So <laughs> taking off from Dr. Karkari and the comments made by GWCL and CWSA, it looks, I was saying that it looks like the water safety planning approach to ensuring safe water for everybody. In my opinion, there is a gap in connecting to the private sector. What do you have to say about that, Mike? 
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, well, you know, the implementation of water setting plants is very young in Ghana Water Company uh, in Ghana, and we are doing this in collaboration with the various stakeholders anyway. But you know, one of the serious gaps is about what Dr. Kakari was talking about, and uh, the industry is really non-treating. You know, you were asking why were they not? Because when it comes to, in Ghana, we have a lot of these policies and the rest, but when it comes to enforcement, it is a big challenge. And industries were always trying to be smart because they think it costs them money to treat their waste to meet the effluent standards. So if the enforcement for compliance is not effective or not in place, they would not comply. They would just, because it costs them nothing to just discharge their waste. And we as users of the resources, as we are doing water safety plan, you know, we are not regulators and we cannot enforce these words. So you can bring on board all these uh, stakeholders, but if the regulatory agencies are also not enforcing for compliance, the users or the utility providers are very little to do. Mm -hmm. You can bring them on board and all those things, but we all know what is happening when it comes to waste management, industrial waste, in the galamsey issues. At the very top, the, the political will and all those things to really tackle these challenging issues. So the utility providers who are just users of the resource and are not uh, regulatory agencies, they cannot enforce. So what we are doing, when you come to the water safety plants now, the catchment aspect is quite a bigger challenge now. So what the utilities are able to handle effectively now is the treatment uh, component, then the uh, distribution what component. Then another issue, which is also a bigger challenge, is at the consumer user interface, where now the water comes to your system, you have to you store your own water in hand. So that is where there is also another issue. But this intermediate, we are able to handle it effectively. But to handling the resource is a very complex and need a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, management approach to uh, to bring end. If the laws are effective and they are being enforced, so the major gap here is what? Effective enforcement of these various regulations and laws for compliance. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Aite. So um, just to, to wrap up quickly, we, we've discussed a lot of things. Um, the source of our problems, the impact is having on our water, our health, the impact is having on the operations of treatment plants, what industries are doing to uh, destroy the environment, so to speak. In I just want a quick remark from all our panelists on what's, what is the way forward, what's the future? Maybe in one minute, starting with you, Mr. Delay. Yeah, um, to me, the way forward is, um, is to protect our water bodies. We should put all hands on deck and make sure that our water bodies are safe because we all take this, we all take the raw water, we treat, and then we distribute. So if this raw water is polluted or contaminated, then uh, we, we are in serious trouble. Then I also urge um, the regulators to ensure compliance among the industries that discharge waste into our water bodies, because that's the only way we can safeguard our water. Yeah. Thank you. So the way forward, I would like to quote uh, one statistic here from the UNDP. They are saying 80% of wastewater goes into the waterways without adequate treatment. And this is globally. 
So you can tell that it is nothing new here in Ghana. But as my colleague Mark here has said, if we can ensure compliance, when it comes to the regulations, the laws are there for all these industries to comply. But then forcing the industries to comply is the major problem now. So we should concentrate our efforts to ensure that these industries, they are in business to make money, to make profit. So whatever they have to do, the responsibility that they have to take to ensure that the masses are protected must be done. So enforcement compliance should be the step we should take to ensure that these wastewater are treated adequately before they are discharged into our water bodies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think what I would like to say is like we all, they all normally say water is life or water is our life. And water is so critical to every sector of the economy. Even apart from that, uh, our ecosystems services function. So if we don't really take the water resources management effectively or seriously as a nation, then we st we, we 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 will be missing out or we be it will suffer a very serious setback because without water nothing as is no industry health and all those things and it is our responsibility to ensure that these resources are protected for the fit for fill our bread basket public health protection and coming to the SDGs where water is the cornerstone for all the, the 70 goals of the ADGs, they all depend on water. And water being a, Ghana being the signatory to the SDGs or even a partner to the chair, if we don't wake up to tackle the water issues seriously, we as a nation will be missing out in meeting all the 17 goals of the SDGs. So as a nation, we have to rise up the location and tackle the situation head on and we can get there. Well, thank you for your immeasurable uh, contribution to this discussion. At Clean Earth Scientific, we we say that our mission is to protect public health, to protect the product quality, to protect the consumers. So we are happy to to liaise with all these stakeholders, with industry, with all which whichever sector you 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 trade or you work in. Once you use water, we are happy to facilitate your your needs with uh, any state agency and even for your own industrial purposes. So thank you for joining us for this panel discussion and we hope we interact with you soon on other platforms. Thank you very much.